Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's uh, I'm so happy to be here. Uh, my name is H. R. Okney. I'm an instructional designer with Center for Academic Innovation at Western Oregon University. And today I'll be uh, reviewing some accessibility considerations uh, and present some tools to observe those uh, considerations. All right, so, so uh, some of the uh, popular uh, topics in accessibility when developing an OER Re, uh, resource, uh, you know, are basically uh, making sure the uh, pages are laid out properly. So the page structure is observed properly. Like the fonts are accessible. There is enough uh, contrast in pages and in fonts. So there are alternate texts for images. Uh, there are captions or transcripts for media. Uh, the links are presented in an accessible way. The tables are accessible, uh, and some of, and we're going to just be reviewing these uh, topics today. So first off, uh, uh, when de developing a, an open educational resource or any resource for that matter, uh, it's important to lay out the document using the uh, structure tools that the platform uh, provides. Uh, this is, for instance, open author, which is provided by Creative Commons. Uh, the screenshot shows how uh, a, uh, the page could be laid out using the built-in uh, structure tools that uh, Open Author provides, for instance. So also uh, using bullets and numbers effectively is a good strategy to lay out uh, the document in an accessible way. So these bullets, numbers, and headings would tell a screen reader how to read the document, basically for someone who's using a screen reader uh, instead of uh, reading it uh, on the page. They're listening to the screen reader. So as to fonts, uh, uh, the general strategy is to use simple, familiar, easily parsed, appropriately sized and spaced fonts. And traditionally, sans serif fonts have been found to be more accessible, but that's not uh, uh, a conclusive uh, piece of evidence these days, especially due to the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the quality we have in our uh, screens, basically. But some of the most uh, accessible fonts have been found to be Verdana, Tahama, Arial, Georgia, and uh, you know, and some of them are sans serif and some of them are serif, depending on the context. Uh, some fonts could be used for titles and some could be for longer stretches of text. Uh, usually uh, uh, sans serif fonts are used for longer stretches of text, whereas uh, sans serif fonts are used for, uh, you know, titles and headings. Yeah. So as to contrast, again, uh, it's important to uh, keep a contrast ratio of at least seven to one for normal text and 4.5 to one for large text based on web accessibility guidelines, WCAG, uh, triple A guidelines. And large text is defined to be uh, 14 points, uh, you know, typically 18.66 pixels and bold or larger or 18 points, especially in presentations uh, using overhead projectors. Yeah, it's, uh, I see a question in the chat from Rachel. Uh, a contrast ratio is basically the contrast between the foreground color and the background color. And we're going to be experimenting with this later when we talk about the tools. That's a great question, thank you. So moving on, uh, images worth content or uh, content images need to be uh, also having alternate text to be accessible. Uh, students who cannot see the page, uh, blind students or uh, visually impaired students who use the screen readers uh, cannot access the content images. So they listen to their screen readers 
and uh, uh, it's important that we provide alternate text for for the for the images worth content. For images for, we use for the creation, we don't need to provide alternate text because they're used for uh, decoration purposes only. And this image uh, or a screenshot uh, is from Canvas. Canvas allows you to uh, provide an alternate text for the image you use or just mark it as decorative uh, depending on uh, the purpose. So some guidelines for uh, providing alternate text, uh, uh, be precise, uh, be brief, do not repeat information, and do not use the phrases images of or graphic of to describe the image. Also text in images tend to be uh, not accessible. Uh, the, uh, it's not a good idea to provide text in uh, images. So the better option would be to provide actual text along with pictures. And captions or transcripts for media. Uh, if we are embedding videos in our OERs, uh, we need to make sure that there are closed captions for uh, students who uh, require them, uh, English language learners or uh, others uh, who use uh, screen readers and can't watch the video. Uh, uh, so uh, closed captions are important. And this is again, this, this screenshot is from Canvas showing how uh, an, uh, a closed caption file has been attached to this video. Presenting links to students uh, or to the readers uh, uh, also requires that we uh, link the title instead of presenting the link. Uh, if the purpose, however, is to read the link uh, it's okay to uh, present the URL, but uh, it's best practice to uh, link uh, the title if uh, we're, we're using links in the document instead of uh, pasting the URL directly into the text. So don't post your cute cat videos like this. For tables, uh, so... Uh, Again, uh, using tables requires its own uh, changes and settings. Uh, most uh, publishing platforms like uh, Pressbook and Open Author, they already set uh, scopes and captions or allow you to set scopes and captions on your table so you don't have to worry about that. Uh, uh, but if you're developing your own website, for instance, you need to make sure that you provide the code uh, to uh, identify the scopes and captions in a table so that a person using a screen reader also uh, understands uh, the presentation of the table. And again, table is about content. We use tables to present content uh, uh, graphically, basically, uh, in a more graphical way. So it's important to provide the scopes and captions for data tables. Some use tables to lay out the document. This is not a good practice, but most web developers do. If we're creating uh, a book, an open educational resource, for instance, uh, it's good practice to uh, provide tables only when we were presenting data instead of uh, laying out the document. So this is screenshot is from Canvas. Canvas allows you to uh, attach scopes and captions to your tables when, when you use them. All right, <laughs> this is the first part of the presentation, just reviewing some uh, accessibility tools. If there are any questions at this point, we could take them uh, for five minutes. Um, you did have one question as to what a contrast ratio, you're talking about uh, at the very beginning about contrast ratios, what exactly that is? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. And I think I addressed that. Uh, the contrast ratio uh, is about uh, the difference between the foreground color and the background color in a text. And when reviewing a screen uh, contrast checkers in a 
uh, in a while, uh, in, 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 a, in a minute, we're, we're going to be practicing with the ratio as well. All right, so moving on. Okay, um, so if you, decide, if you decide to use Google productivity tools to develop your OER, so uh, Google uh, Docs, for instance, allows you to uh, lay out your document using the built-in features, right? So here, for instance, in this screenshot, you can see that uh, engagement in the text has been marked as a heading one in this document. And the, the other uh, part, the, the text following the heading is marked as a paragraph, for instance. And also uh, Google Docs allows you to add alternate texts in your uh, images. So uh, by right-clicking on the picture, you have the option to uh, select all text from the menu and add your alternate text to the image to make it accessible. If you're uh, a Microsoft Word user, mostly, uh, Microsoft Word also allows you to do the same thing. So you have uh, the layout features uh, under the home menu, and you could do the same using uh, you know, the heading, the styles section of uh, the toolbox. The same goes with alternate text. Right click in the image will allow you to edit all text. And also on the right, you can see uh, there are guidelines and instructions uh, on how to do that. So what is the subject? Uh, what is the setting, the actions or interactions, other relevant information for the students to uh, know or hear about basically. And also uh, Microsoft Word has an option to generate a description based on their artificial intelligence uh, uh, built-in features. So it's good to practice with it and see. So it's not 100% uh, accurate. So uh, I think ultimately you need to provide your own descriptions based on the context that you're uh, an expert in. Canvas does, allows you to do the same thing if you're using Canvas for instruction, or if you're developing a course to share with the Canvas community on Canvas Commons, uh, feel free, uh, make sure to uh, uh, lay out the pages appropriately using the built-in features of the content editor in Canvas. And for images also, uh, once you click image options, you have the option to add alternate text or uh, mark the image as uh, de de decorative. All right, so for contrast, uh, there are, uh, there's a very good tool uh, by WebAIM called Color Contrast Checker, and also a, another tool called uh, Link, Con Link Contrast Checker, which you can try uh, and use. And let's take a look at that right now. So um, I'm going to be clicking color contrast checker right now. And here is the page. So as you can see, uh, the contrast checker will allow you to select your foreground color and also your background color and see what works. So here uh, it automatically uh, calculates the co co contrast ratio for you. Uh, depending on the color that you're using. No, 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 And it's telling you uh, uh, whether you pass the normal text, large text, and graphical objects and user interface components uh, bars for accessibility. So if you don't know the codes, the hex codes uh, for your foreground and background color, there's a very good tool that you can install on your browser. And it's called uh, ColorZilla. ColorZilla is uh, an excellent tool for extracting the color values from any page uh, element. And I can try it right now. I have it installed. Let's take a look at that. All right, so since uh, it's an extension, uh, 
installed on Chrome or Firefox, so I'm using Chrome right now. If I click my extension icon here, Colorzilla is a tool that is installed already. When I click it, it will load the Colorzilla uh, menu. And then I can just click where I want to see the hex code of, of, of the document. So for instance, this one, this green, if I click the screen, it will automatically uh, copy the hex code to my uh, clipboard, which I then can use in uh, a web aim contrast checker. So if I click here and paste, so uh, it will automatically change to the color that I was, uh, I, I copied into my clipboard. So this one is uh, white or gray. So let me uh, get a more uh, contrasted color like the, uh, green. So how about, Oh, I zoom does not allow me to see very well. I'm going to close out of, oh, okay, got it. So let's do that again. All right. Can you see my screen, my screen folks? Okay, great. Um, so if I'm, so I need a green or something else. So let's try. So I'm going to get a green from here. Hmm. All right, so I think um, there's an issue with using it while, while using Zoom. So I'll do my best, but I think you should be fine using it. Yeah. So, all right. Yeah, so that's how it works, but it doesn't seem to work for me right now. Uh, maybe I'm on Zoom and that's that's what's causing it, but that's okay. So as long as you copy the hex code, you can use it in co color contrast checker. And let's choose a green, for instance, here. So using green uh, on a green foreground on a white uh, background is not recommended a light green at least, because uh, the colors are not contrastive enough, right? And the contrast ratio is low, right? And as you can see, uh, you're failing all uh, uh, the bars here. So for normal text, for large text, for graphical objects. So what we need to do to increase the contrast ratio is to just uh, go darker on the color. And as you can see, as I uh, make the green darker, I, I can now pass. And these color, uh, colors are now contrastive enough to be used in my uh, document. So you may not even need to check your contrast uh, because your built-in tool allows you and gives you these tools. For instance, in Canvas, uh, you have this option. So Canvas uh, has a built-in feature to check for and allow you to fix contrast issues. But uh, there are times when you want to develop your resource and you need to make sure the contrast works. So uh, a tool such as Color Contrast Checker is helpful. And also the, the links which appear on your page could be, uh, could, could be affected by the, uh, the coding uh, of the style, the, the style of the, the, the web you're developing. Um, so you need to make sure the links also, the colors are right. Uh, when you click a link, the color changes. And at that time also, uh, does the, is the contrast enough for someone uh, to, uh, to, to, to be okay reading the document? So checking the contrast uh, is very important. All right. As to closed captions, uh, YouTube allows you to uh, auto-generate closed captions uh, very easily. As long, uh, so when you upload your videos to your channels, so you need to create a channel if you don't have one. Uh, when you when you uh, upload your video to the to your channel, uh, you know uh, YouTube will uh, auto-generate captions uh, after a while, and then you could just edit them, right? 
Uh, so and attach the uh, closed captions to the video directly. And uh, you could also download them into a file and then use them in other platforms, such as uh, your learning management system, uh, Canvas, Moodle, Blackboard. So also uh, Google Drive allows you to do the same thing. Uh, Google and YouTube, I mean, YouTube is part of Google. So, so the same uh, uh, technology is used to auto-generate uh, your closed captions. And also you, you're able to edit them later when they are auto-generated to, to make sure everything works. And accessibility checkers. We have a lot of accessibility checkers in different tools. For instance, Open Author allows you to uh, check the accessibility of your document very easily. And Open Author is a great tool to develop uh, open resources. Canvas has an accessibility feature as well. Uh, one, it notifies you of issues which may occur during the uh, authoring of your document and you can fix them easily, detect them and fix them there. And uh, WAVE web accessibility evaluation tool is also a great tool to check the accessibility of pages. Uh, let me click it for you folks to take a look. So you just, uh, this allows you to uh, check out a website and look for accessibility issues with it. So if your resource is a website, for instance, you could definitely check it out. For instance, this is my institution website. And if I do an accessibility check on it, it will tell me what's good or what's not good about it. So here, for instance, you can see there is no contrast error. That's good. That's good. There are seven errors, however, which we need to fix. There are 12 alerts. There are 30 features and 39 structural elements and ARIA, 21 ARIA uh, you know, elements in the page. And if you want to know more about these, so you could click view details and it will tell you what the problem is. Or you could, just, you could just take a look at the page. For instance, here, what's wrong with this part of the page? So if I click this, it will tell me, oh, image alternative text is present. OK, which is a good thing. Uh, so yes, this indicates uh, there's a, every, so we have an alternate text for this image we have used. Uh, here, we have a heading two, because heading one is this part of the document going forward. Here, there's a problem there. One of the errors is that uh, the alternative text is not uh, present for this graphic, which has been used. We need to go back at the alternate text to make sure uh, this part is accessible. So go, yeah, moving on. So you will see detailed uh, analyses of uh, your website and you can uh, go back and fix the issues which you might have missed. And finally, here are some resources, some tools, uh, some image database, databases and also some databases for you and some license, the licenses section of Creative Commons. Thank you very much. Uh, if you have a question at this point, uh, I'd be happy to address. The, the chat has been very active. So you have had some questions okay. and then other people have, have been answering them. Oh, great. Um, one, of, one of the questions, which I'll let you answer as well. Um, and that was, um, how, do, how does the use of layout tools improve the learner's experience of the page in the use of their uh, screen reader? So in other words, why should we use the layout tool that you were suggesting? How does that help? That's a great question. So uh, the, the, layout, uh, the layout tools basically introduce uh, HTML codes in the document. And these HTML codes communicate to a screen reader how this specific section of the text should be read out. For instance, if there's a heading, a screen reader will indicate that this is a heading or it, either in saying it or in uh, 
uh, indicating it in the tone, uh, depending on the you know the tool. So using layout tools basically uh, adds those codes which a screen reader uses to identify the layout or the structure of the document. The screen readers uh, these days do a great job. One of the uh, very uh, useful tools is Immersive Reader by Microsoft, uh, which again has a, a built-in uh, extension you could install on Chrome and use. And it also, it also could be used, uh, install on Canvas for a students. So, but still uh, as developers, we make sure we observe these considerations, uh, hoping that we reach to everyone. Thank you. Um, I, I would make one comment. I think um, everything you said is wonderful. And I've been like furiously writing down notes of things I need to go <laughs> check out. So I'm very appreciative because I, I think a lot of content creators, we get so focused on getting content out, particularly getting it out quickly under deadline that we take some yeah. shortcuts that we kind of regret afterwards. So best practices, you've done a great job. Um, I'm glad to hear. The big it. thing I see is there's there's two things that people do. One is um, having image driven content, like look at this picture and tell me what's happening or what's different between these two pictures, which is completely inaccessible. Mm -hmm. So that's one I'm always trying to get people to stop. The other one is um, the use of color to talk about grammatical topics. So the subject is in red and the verb is in green which mm -hmm. is wonderful, but if you have a screen reader, the screen reader doesn't pay attention to that color and it doesn't pay yeah. attention to bold and it doesn't pay attention to other things. Absolutely. And so if you're, if, you're, if you're designing things and you're using color to, and color and images to convey mm -hmm. meaning, and that meaning isn't, um, as he said, decorative, that becomes a, a real issue. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, as you said, uh, as developers, we may be so uh, focused on the development phase of uh, the project that we uh, miss out on the accessibility issues. And we just need to step back after we develop our text or as we go forward with the text, if you know uh, these uh, uh, popular accessibility issues if you, if you know about them, we observe them as we go along, that's, it's, it's, it's great. But if we haven't done that, we just need to take a step back and take a look at the document again and make sure we, we uh, observe these uh, accessibility of, I don't know, considerations, make, making sure everyone is able to access the document. We have put so much time and effort in and uh, developed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm convinced, to be honest, there needs to be almost a full conference on accessibility. Um, totally. Yeah. The big issue I think that we've been seeing is um, making sure that your page is encoded for the language that you're using so that mm -hmm. the screen reader knows when the page is supposed to be read in Spanish, the page tells it that. Because what a screen reader will do by default is start reading your Spanish page or your German page in English, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which is of little or no help to the to the user, yeah. Um, but then we've encountered this weird counter problem, and that is that if you encode the page for German, then all of the navigation is then in German. Yeah. So when it gets to a bulleted list, it says that in German, and if it's got uh, italics or a heading, like all of that navigation is in German, which at a beginning level the student doesn't know, <laughs> and so you sort of back yourself <laughs> into a corner. I know. Wow. So if I have a if I have some time, I could show you the uh, immersive reader tool, which has been developed by Microsoft and is free to use. Uh, if you could do it really quickly, yeah, I'd be interested in seeing that. Okay, yeah, absolutely. Let me load the page. My, Microsoft has guaranteed that it's going to be free forever so it's a great tool to use
All right, so yeah, I have a page up now. I'm going to be sharing my screen really quickly. That's a great tool for uh, teaching and learning as well. So uh, this is Canvas, as you can see. Uh, so, uh, and when Immersive Reader is installed, you have a button on the top right of the page, so you can click it and it will just uh, create a text-based version of your document. And so here's a text, as you can see, and here's uh, the play icon, which you can use. I'm assuming it's reading that aloud. We can't, we don't have your audio as oh, part of the share. Okay, yeah, let me optimize my, uh, optimize my sharing for video. All right, there we go, yes, here it is. Purpose. An essential part of being a language teacher is using appropriate tools to teach. So, yeah, as you heard, so it reads the text and you have the option to uh, change the voice speed. You can also select a female or male voice. In addition to that, you have so many other tools for uh, modifying your text. You could change the text size and you could uh, increase the spacing or decrease the spacing. You could change the fonts to get a more accessible font. You could also change the themes and create more contrast. And there are other options as well. Also, uh, you have, for language learning specifically, you have a lot of good tools here. You could just mark your syllables. You could, uh, you know, mark your nouns, your verbs, your adjectives, your adverbs, and also you could show labels. Uh, so you could mark them in colors, basically, in contrastive colors. Further, you, you have uh, other accessibility tools such as line focusing. So uh, you could focus on one line at a time. You could focus on three lines at a time. And if you have a longer stretch of text, uh, you could focus on more five lines at a time. You also have a picture dictionary, which goes with this tool. So once you click, for instance, you could listen and also Teach. see a picture. Teach. Uh, wow, another, that's great. The, yeah, that's wonderful. And also you have the translate tool, which allows you to uh, translate the whole page into a certain language. You have a I'm long gonna, I'm gonna list guess of languages. This, this audience may object to that one, though. <laughs> <laughs> Which audience? We, yeah, we should we should probably wrap up so I can, we can get the next. Okay. Presenter. Thank oh, you wonderful. very much. Yes, this is absolutely. a very important topic, I think. So thank you very much. Absolutely, I'm happy. Uh, I was happy to be here, folks. And feel free to reach out if you have any questions or. Concerns. Thank you very much. Yes. Yes. Thank, thank you. you.